Um, and I always started off with the stupid comment, um, I started off as a turd herder. Uh, we affectionately called ourselves turd herders, uh, wastewater treatment plant operator. Where we had to put up with everybody's you know what. Anyway, uh, so what are we talking about today here? Do I just hit enter? Uh, Earth space bar. Um, what is an environmental risk? Uh, how do these quote unquote bad things happen? Uh, what type of contaminants are there out there? And I'm just going to, I'll briefly go through all this stuff just real quick, kind of more of like a career, you know, what do we do in this industry? Um, history of regulations and why, and then we'll go through some, what is the uh, evaluation process and, and how do we remediate? And what is it are we remediating? Um, basically, we got these environmental, like I said, I started in the mid-70s. Um, it was early on, we were just getting Clean Water Act on. There was just we really didn't have a whole lot of regulations. Regulations started coming about because we were realizing we had all these products, all these compounds that were very, very beneficial to us economically, uh, and in terms of um, product development and whatnot. And most in the military, military is huge when it comes to remediation concerns, um, and because the military had a, a, an objective, they had to. Answer a call. Waste was the last thing on the mind. Oh, put it over there. Yeah, well, let's put it over there. Same with industry. Let's put it over there. To the point where the Cayuga, was it the Cayuga, Alan? Yes, it was. In, in Ohio, yeah, going through Cleveland, Ohio, in the 60s, used to catch on fire. Uh, a river used to catch on fire because there was so much toxic waste being pumped into this thing that occasionally it would ignite. Um, so they started coming with laws. Uh, has anybody ever read the book, in the last class I, I referenced the book, The Jungle? Has anybody ever read the book, The Jungle, by Upton Sinclair? Great book. It was written in the early 1900s, and it's about slaughterhouses. Well, it used to be, guys, you know, you'd lose hands, fingers, arms, limbs, die in industry. Because there was no regulations, there was no laws that promulgated how we had to behave and what industry people had to provide us when we were workers. Uh, we ultimately came up with OSHA. Um, over time, OSHA developed uh, the Occupational Safety Health Administration. Yes. I think. Yes. Just look up Google OSHA and they'll fill out the acronym and everything for you. OSHA tells you what you do in the workplace. Uh, for instance, you can't be exposed to benzene. You can't benzene is a cyclical ring, volatile organic compound, uh, highly carcinogenic. Benzene is what you're breathing a lot when you're, when, you're, when you're pumping a car with gas. It's one of the things that makes gas smell so good. If we had to operate when you filled your gas up at the car, the way OSHA would have to make us operate in an industrial setting, if we were exposed to those levels of OSHA, uh, uh, to benzene, as you pump your car in, you'd be in a full face respirator. You'd have a scuba gear on your, a CBA pack on your back, and you'd be breathing air. Because the level of benzene you're exposing your, yourself at that time is such that it's a, it's a health hazard if you were working under those conditions. But the economic factors to that don't allow it. We can't have these spacesuits at every gas station. Economically, we can't do that. So when we get into the, it, what we'll see a lot with, um, with regulations, and there's a slide coming up, you know, you know, this is a sweet spot, and that's where you want to hit. But whenever you come up with anything, there's economic. You can go ahead and hit the slide, Alan. Yep. Environmental. And uh, social. And you, you see that, just about anything can be broken out of that. But when I first got into the industry, um, you got in it because, you know, golly, I'm going to help clean up the world. We're going to clean up the world. We're going to make it a safer place. And we're going to, we're going to go get it. Unfortunately, this thing, more often than not, gets in the way. And you learn, you know, one of the neat things about being young is you have ideas. You have goals. You have energy. And you get out of the industry. I don't want to be a downer. But you get into the industry, and they beat you to a pulp. <laughs> you know, so you got to keep your energy. you got to keep your, 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 your zest for life. Because this will drive you down. Um, what happens is I'm not necessarily, I don't bring, I don't clean up sites per se. Sometimes we do. But more often than not, I bring customers into compliance with the laws that have been established. 
When we first started establishing these laws, for instance, like petroleum hydrocarbons, the big thing in the 80s was underground storage tanks at gas stations. We had to rip them all out because they were just a single tank. And over time, that tank would corrode. It would rust and it would get holes in it. And there was nothing that, that gasoline or the diesel or the, or the oil that was in that tank underground, you know, right here, this guy, would start corroding. And as he corroded, stuff would start seeping out, causing a contaminant, contaminant, contaminant concern. And so what regulations did is they said, hey, look, that's not working. We need to have leak protection. So we had to take all these tanks out, replace them with a double wall tank. It had an annual. Instead of just that, you had this. And then right here, you had a probe. What happens with, with, with um, spills, if you, get a, if you get the liquid coming out, well, this starts to vaporize. Just like if we open a can of gas over there, and we're standing over here, pretty soon we're going to smell that. Mother Nature wants everything to come to equilibrium. And if we got a tiny pinhole leak in that tank, the liquid might not be able to get out. The molecule, the liquid molecule might not, might not be able to get out, but the vapor can. And so what happens, so this vapor precedes the plume, and you have this leak detection. I know, I'm completely different from the last one. Okay. <laughs> I tell stories. Um, but this now, this was, this was a legal law, came into effect in the 80s, that helped prevent future leaks. Because now, the sensor would go and it'd say, hey, you have vapors in this annular space. So we could then go test that tank, determine is it, is it still structurally stable, and fix it before it actually spilled. So there's a beneficial um, uh, thing. One of the, but what happened with laws is we also realized, boy, this, this, this contaminant thing is huge. It takes a lot of money to take that out of, out, of the, out of the ground. And in the 80s, what happened is, I don't know, anybody from the West Coast? Um, there's a group up called Arco. You've probably heard of Arco. Arco is a refining company, but they have a lot of gas stations out in the West Coast. They're who started the mini mart. They're who started making Jake's a gas station with stuff in it. It used to be the gas station was the guy that came out and they'd pump your gas, they'd change your oil, they actually washed your windows for you. This back when gas was, I honestly got remember gas being 23 cents a gallon. Um, wow. I'm that old. That I am that old. Uh. <laughs> I remember, I lived in uh, L.A. during the, the, the crisis in 74, yeah. I think the first yeah. oil crisis, but yeah. it went to like 89 cents. And the longest I stood in line for fuel was four and a half hours. We were four and a half hours, it was on a Sunday, and basically we just pushed our cars. You were limited to 10 gallons, you could only get 10 gallons at a time, um, and it was ridiculous. I mean, there was, it got <laughs> ugly, it got ugly. Um, I had an old Vita bug, my buddy had an old Vita bug, you had uh, even odd plates. You could only get gas on an e if you had a, if you ended an odd number or an even number that told you what day you could get gas, and so uh, we used to switch our plates all the time if we needed. You know, we cheated. Uh, so anyway, so anyway, little little story. Um, so these these laws and regulations. What we found was this thing economics. This is supposed to be that. So they didn't transfer on the on the um, on the when you yeah just I'm didn't. IBM. You guys are Apple. Yeah. Um, the economic factors dominated. And we realized all of a sudden there's all this stuff to clean up, and we don't have any money. Industry doesn't have any money to do this. Mom and Pa don't have any money to... So what, go back, what happened is Arco bought all these gas stations because they had wealth of money. You have some Mom and Pa who had a fuel here, uh, had a fuel station for 30 years with a little tiny leak, and all of a sudden they're hit with a $60,000, $80,000 remediation cost. Arco moves in, buys the property for a penny on the dollar. Mom and Pa are out, and, and Arco is making, you know, making a bunch of money off of this. Well, economics. Um, part of those economics also were the environmental factor. Right, when I take that tank out of the ground, what is clean? You know, what am I trying to, what is compliance? How do I make this site compliance? And early on, it used to be for a petroleum hydrocarbon, gas. 100 parts per million. You guys, you guys know, measure, you know, for every million parts in a box of X, 
If it had 101 of them, that was a petroleum hydrocarbon, that box had to get taken away. That soil had to be removed. There was no rhyme or reason as to what was 100. You know, think about it. I used to, I used to do mobile laboratory work. You know, I would drive a van up. It was awesome work. I'd drive a van up to a job site. They're removing these tanks. They would bring me soil, or I would collect soil, groundwater samples. And in my lab, in my van, I had gases. I had an a infrared spec. Um, I had a, a gas chromatography, and I had an AA, atomic absorption, for doing metals. We don't use atomic absorption anymore. But um, I could do EPA certified analyses right there on site. But okay, you got this gas station, and there's 98 parts. You know, oh, Yahoo, we made it. You're clean. But what if I had 102? It's dirty. What's the di what, statistically, What's the difference between 98 and 102? There's nothing. You know, and so what happened is as we evolved these rules, we started taking in risk. We started taking into account exposure. We never really took into account human exposure before, but we're getting smarter, we're getting smarter, we're getting smarter. And so now we're making these cleanup standards, we're making these cleanup standards more responsive to the level of risk that's being exposed to us versus how much is in the ground. So at some sites, let's say I got a site that's going to be a, a, a little kid's nursery. Well, we got to clean that place up to the nth degree. But let's say it's going to be a football stadium, and it's going to be covered with concrete, and, and, and nothing is going to be seeping out. Well, we can leave a lot of contamination in the ground there, because now we're taking into account risk. Does that make any sense? Um, unfortunately, it's your economics that rule. Then it's your social, then it's your, your social demands, especially with products. My sister, who's 10 years older than I am, I'm, I'm in my older upper 50s. And in, in the 60s, Sue used to, there'd be a cloud of hairspray in the room. Um, fingernail polish, one of the nastiest things on the planet. Vinyl chloride. Uh, your shower curtain, a cheap shower curtain that you buy at uh, Target, Target. Um, you know, and you open up this the, that kind of clear but not clear white whitish plastic shower curtain for like eight ninety nine. You know, nine ten bucks. Do we have car seats made out of the same? Car stuff? seats are made out of car seats. Got poly uh, polychlorine. You got PC cars are cars are brutal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Um, that shower curtain is one molecule. It's just one huge molecule of vinyl chloride. Well, vinyl chloride, if we breathe it, is really, really carcinogenic, really, really nasty. So hairspray was basically vinyl chloride. And so that my sister could have a beehive, you know, that went up to about here in 1966. I actually saw Diana Ross in the Supremes when I was a kid, live. How do you like that? You That's never saw awesome. that. You weren't even no. born yet, were you? When, when was this? 65? No, no, no. Not, <laughs> even, not even a glimmer. My sister and Kathy Crozier had to... Oh, this is not film. I'm sorry. Had to go, they <laughs> it wanted to go to the Detroit State Fair, a Michigan State Fair. I was seven, and they couldn't go unless they took me. And I remember, I, I remember, I remember it vividly. But anyway, Diana Ross was uh, Michael Jackson's trainer, basically. He was her non-her son, basically. Protege, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, sorry, sorry, sorry. Where was I? Um, chloride. So... The benefits of a product sometimes far outweigh the environmental factors and even the health factors. You know, but we're making so much frigging money on this thing, you know. So what is risk? Basically, risk is we've quantified a number that we're willing to roll the dice health-wise in terms of for a society. We're, allow we're allowing, because there's so much benefit to this product or for whatever it might be, we're going to elect three people out of a thousand, or whatever that number may be, to get sick, to have the chance, the probability, to get sick. Statistically, we have figured that the benefit of this thing is more than the health non-benefits to three out of a thousand of us. And we do that every day. We do that with everything we live with, everything we eat, everything that we see, Turf everything field. we breathe. Um, or synthetic turf fields like that. Synthetic, yes. synthetic turf fields. Um, 
<laughs> you let great that love. surfaces to play on. Yeah. You, know, um, you weigh the benefits versus the um, consequence. So the 